All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope um, you're having a good morning, afternoon, evening. Thank you so much for joining us. This is going to be, I think, a quite ex exciting uh, session. Um, as much as this is a Stockholm Water Week, our focus on today's panel and discussion is really the conservation area, the land part, and within it, the water underneath. So welcome to um, the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area session. It's going to focus on creating value chains for all and the role of water within that. My name is Steve Collins. I'm, the, I'm with the USAID Resilient Waters Program, and I'm the Livelihoods and Adaptation Advisor. So we got to quite a full program today, so we're going to get straight into it. And first of all, to open the session, I'd invite Patrice Cabea from the SADEC Infrastructure and Services Directorate, where he is the Senior Program Officer, to just make some opening comments. Patrice, over to you. Yes, no, thank you very much, uh, the facilitator, for inviting me to come and uh, make an uh, opening remark. And uh, good afternoon and welcome to this particular important session on Gaza project. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, who are part of this particular program session, on behalf of the SADC Secretariat, Executive Secretary, our Excellent Dr. Sergoman Dora, allow me to greet all of you and indeed express my gratitude and indeed an honor to make opening remarks at this important meeting, especially when Gaza EFCA project is coming to its completion. We note that Gaza, which is the, the, the world's largest terrestrial frontier conservation area, is really at the crux of the two major river basins in southern Africa, which really embed the southern region which really comprised of five member states. And uh, it faces a challenge of climate change, which really affects larger numbers of fragile communities, women and biodiversity in terms of water security. This project was really very significant to deal with these challenges and ensure that water security was attained within then across and along river basin. As you are aware, the Gaza project has provided opportunities for better water management and cooperation, which constitutes one of the great tools to ensure that our water resources are managed efficiently to meet future water demand of the population of this particular river basin. We note that this event is important in terms of demonstrating cooperation at multiple scales for water resource management. The Southern region appreciates the work done under the Gaza project, which has demonstrated collaborative efforts between the Gaza Secretariat, River Basin Organization, and other interested stakeholders. This indeed demonstrates how all partners and the stakeholders are fully committed to ensure that water security are efficiently managed in a very sustainable way. And this cooperation is mostly critical, specifically when it comes to water security, dealing with issues of climate resilience, sustainable biodiversity, to ensure that social economic development is achieved through better management of our resources in an economic way. As Gaza project come to its, com to its completion, the lesson learned will be disseminated to the entire SADC region in order to adopt those, the best practices which will strengthen our cooperation in the management of water resources. And this will indeed help us to attain our water security for all. With these few remarks, ladies and gentlemen, I take this opportunity to wish you a fruitful session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, that was wonderful. You know, um, as uh, as all of us are certainly on this on the webinar from Southern Africa, we mustn't forget there was a time when there was no SADC. There was a time when uh, SADC was called, they were called the frontline states. 
in the struggle against apartheid and decolonization. And I think what is coming out of SADC with these transfrontier conservation areas and these river basin organizations really epitomizes what SADC is about, cooperating together uh, across borders that were created by colonialism. So thank you very much for those opening remarks. Um, they were very helpful. And now perhaps to move on to, as I said, one of the, the projects of SADC is the, are the transfrontier conservation areas spanning uh, across the country borders. And I'd invite Dr. Nyambe Nyambe, who is the executive director of the CASA Secretariat, to also make a few opening comments. Uh, over to you, Dr. Nyambe. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, distinguished uh, colleagues. It's indeed a great honor to be here joining you on this very important uh, event, focusing on the significance and risks that water creates for Kaza. The submission from uh, Sadiq, the opening remarks from Mr. Kaveh actually covers it all. And allow me to briefly highlight some of the key issues. Number one, is just the reality that these resources we're talking about are shared. The water resources we're talking about are a shared resource. They are facing challenges around pollution, of abstraction, infrastructure development, and the various challenges actually can only be dealt with if there is good governance, transboundary governance of the resources. Hence, collaboration, cooperation, and understanding are very critical. Specifically, we're talking about the opportunities to create value chains that are linked to these water resources, both surface and underground water resources. We need to find mechanisms to better understand what is happening in terms of the status of the, of the water resources, ensure that there is a collaboration at different levels, and including, in the case of the CASA Secretariat, effective engagement with all stakeholders be it NGOs, uh, the two river basin organizations, Okakom and Zamkom, and uh, research institutions and the private sector, because water is indeed everybody's business. Um, I would like to highlight that uh, Kaza is indeed uh, very vulnerable to uh, climate change, and uh, there are risks that relate to environmental flows if we do not manage everything well and uh, there is need to ensure hydrological connectivity through the landscape. And through all this, we cannot forget the role of the private sector and other players in terms of enhancing water stewardship. So I just wanted to say thank you very much, dear colleagues, and I'm looking forward to this uh, deliberation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Nyambe. I, I think you've, um, you've raised the importance of, of issues of partnerships working across sectors, from government to private sector, NGOs, et cetera. Uh, one of the NGOs who, that has been working with, with CASA for quite a while now is the Peace Parks Foundation. And I'd ask uh, Lorraine Buescher from Peace Parks Foundation to just um, introduce herself briefly, and then we'll move on to a presentation. from. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Um, good day, everyone. Um, as Steve introduced myself, um, I'm Lorraine Buescher. I'm a landscape architect working with Peace Parks Foundation um, as a specialist conservation planner. Peace Parks is a conservation organization that supports the development of TFCAs as well as government agencies to manage prote uh, protected areas located within these TFCAs. We will shortly screen a video for you on the TFCA, on the CASA TFCA in particular, titled Conservation for All Through a Joint Water Lens. As revealed by its name, this DFCA straddles two major river basins, the Okavango and the Zambezi. This video will highlight the need for and how the TFCA and basin authorities, as well as a range of support organizations have started to collaborate regarding water management across borders. We trust you will find this informative and thank you and happy view. It dates back to the early 2000s when uh, different stakeholders started speaking about the need to collectively manage the various contiguous resources across the landscape. 
this eventually led in 2006 to the signing of an MOU amongst the partner states of Angola, Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, and the signing of a treaty in 2011, which formally established the Transfrontier Conservation Area, which is a 520,000 square kilometers terrestrial transfrontier conservation area, the largest in the world. The vision of CASA is to establish a world-class transfrontier conservation and tourism destination in the Okavango and uh, Zambezi River Basin regions within the context of sustainable development. With that vision, partner states have committed themselves to a mission which seeks to sustainably manage the CASA ecosystem, its heritage and cultural resources based on conservation tourism models for social economic well-being of the communities and other stakeholders in and around the ecoregion through harmonization of policies, strategies, and practices. The key objectives of CASA include improving livelihoods through sustainable use and conservation of natural resources, and of course, cultural and heritage resources, promoting a complementary network of protected areas, infrastructure development, tourism development through facilitating cross-border tourism. The environment within which CASA depends on their activities, it subsists on the basis of the available water resources and that those resources should be preserved and managed both in terms of fauna and flora. Safeguarding the water security within a landscape such as, such as CASA is obviously a critical component to ensuring its sustainability and viability. Groundwater is the resource that is below the ground. It's invisible. And uh, for that reason, it's oftentimes not really brought into the management sphere, if you like. But nevertheless, groundwater is really critical for a coherent and sustainable management of water resources. And so that's why we need to understand what resources do we have, how are they impacted by use and by, for example, climate change. There are several studies that are being undertaken to inform stakeholders and decision makers around um, the, the state of the water resources in the uh, Okavango Zambezi uh, region. Our efforts over the years has been to strengthen the management and the governance of the Zambezi River Basin. For a long time, there was very little research going into that basin, despite it being very, very important. We've also been working uh, with our stakeholders to uh, develop what we call a basin health report card and it gives pointers to where the basin is being managed well and where there are significant threats that need um, attention. We are also supporting um, the development of hydrological assessment of the Kwando River Basin that is meant to add to the body of knowledge around the, the Kwando and we've not been doing this not only with, with, uh, with the scientists but with um, a number of strategic partners as well to really make sure that um, the, the knowledge that's generated is owned uh, by the member states as well as the intergovernmental bodies that are charged with uh, the responsibility of sustainable water resources management. The Zambia's Water Course Commission provides the broader framework that enables cooperation with CASA to jointly respond to transboundary challenges emanating from the ever-changing water environment and in this case primarily due to climate change, wildlife and human pressures. It's wonderful to, to see that uh, the CASA Secretariat and governments alike as well as all NGOs are coming together to place such a big emphasis on, on water security and really understand how water impacts on everything around it, understand the dynamics of it uh, and, and how the competing forces play out and how we can mitigate against, against this competition. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, uh, Peace Box. And I've seen all those images makes me just want to, to travel again. <laughs> Here we are having a virtual uh, conference uh, from Southern Africa, talking to people in Sweden and beyond. Uh, all of those of you who want to come to Southern Africa, um, come visit us. Uh, you can see the, some of the wonderful places you can, you can come visit. Um, and now I'd like to move along and uh, introduce uh, 
a partner uh, and a colleague of mine that I'm working with on the USAID Resilient Waters Program, Dr. Nkobi Mulele. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Mulele, if you could just introduce um, yourself and uh, the video you would like to share with us. Are you there? Um, yes, I'm here. I'm here. Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to introduce um, this presentation video. It's on partnerships for climate resiliency. And it's work that we are doing. It's capturing the work that we are doing within the US Resilient Waters Program. And in, it's in the context of the challenges that were captured also earlier by uh, Dr. Nyambe Nyambe and Patrice Kabea, for example, uh, variability and climate change impacts in the region. We see that we are now in experiencing frequent droughts, water scarcity, uh, reduced water flows. Those are some of the challenges that we are facing. And also um, access to safe drinking water and sanitation services is a challenge. Biodiversity loss, uh, fragmentation of habitats, human wildlife conflicts, those are some of the challenges. Population growth and related challenges, for example, as the population is growing in the face of change, how can we produce enough food to feed the growing population? Those are some of the challenges that we are facing. So in the context of the Resilient Waters Program, which is a five-year USAID program, we are building partnerships that are contributing to impact pathways at, at various levels, various levels, including local or community, national and regional levels, uh, to, to contribute towards improved resiliency of communities and ecosystems, specifically in the Limpopo and Okavango river basins and associated TFCAs like Kaza, and the GLTFCA, that's the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area. And the approach is simple. Um, we are specifically focusing on a strategy which is three-pronged. It weaves together three thematic areas. This is water, uh, the water sector, people and institutions, and biodiversity and ecosystems. And it also adopts a systems thinking approach. Um, and the emphasis that this video will, will show is how to improve adaptive capacity, coping uh, strategies, absorptive capacity, transformation, because in some cases, the challenges that we are facing require us to transform processes and practices. So this video will highlight that. And it will illustrate a few examples on how we can strengthen participation, partnerships enhancement, facilitation of data-driven um, decision-making. And thank you very much. Please enjoy the video. Thanks a lot.
Thank you, um, Gorby, and uh, the people that were involved in putting that video together. It um, also shows some of the images, some of the challenges that uh, we're facing. And I think a lot of the emphasis um, that Gorby put on was the need to have partnerships to address this. And one of the, the organizations we are very happy to have partnered with on, on this kind of work, looking at groundwater and climate change and building resilience in the uh, Kaza area is Imwe. And I'd ask um, Karen Villor, uh from, from Imwe to uh, introduce uh, the work that she's doing and having a look at a bit more depth, sorry, excuse the pun, at uh, the groundwater issues that we, we're trying to uh, look at. Karen, up to you. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you for the for the session. This is uh, coming along so nicely, and um, I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, this piece of work and this uh, great endeavor that um, the communities and the regional bodies and, and and the governments and so on are, are really coming forward to to do in conjunction. It's it's a pleasure to see, and also as as you mentioned, Steve, this uh, this immense uh, natural. Um, uh, landscape and area that we are dealing with the Casa TFCA is, is, is really special. And so, so really uh, pleased to be part of, of, of this team that are working around these uh, major issues. Um, so I'm Karen Wilhold. I represent uh, IMI, the International Water Management Institute, and uh, we're working towards uh, water resilience. We're working towards water security, very much um, from an integrated perspective uh, with partners working from the regions and uh, in partnership with so many um, <clears throat> stakeholders uh, from, from local farmers all the way to, to, to regional bodies and so on. Uh, in this context, I'm representing IMI from a groundwater perspective, and uh, I will briefly be showing you a video uh, of what we are doing uh, so far in the Casa area in that regard. I think it's very important to just uh, with this emphasize the importance of, of getting to terms with what groundwater is, where is it, um, how does it look like and what can it do for us in terms of uh, better resilience um, and also in terms of transboundary cooperation because some of these resources like rivers are also shared and so we need to understand where these uh, resources are and how we are collaborating around it and finally as i think it came clearly through uh, in the previous presentations is how with climate change we really need to understand how groundwater can come into play in terms of addressing um, water security for local populations, and even for what we discussed in terms of human wildlife conflicts. So those are some of the issues that we are addressing. Thank you very much, Steve. Issues. Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Wilholt. I'm a principal researcher with IMI, the International Water Management Institute. Today, I'll be speaking about groundwater in the Casa Transfrontier Conservation Area. I would like to start by thanking the CASA Secretariat, uh, the Resilient Waters Program under USAID and the Peace Parks Foundation for their support to the work that IMI has been undertaking over the last half to one year and for their early acknowledgement of the role of groundwater in, in these uh, conservation areas. The area that we're focusing on in our work is the Quando system, which consists of the Quando River Basin and the Quando Wildlife Dispersal Area, which uh, comprises about one fifth of the Casa TFCA in the northwestern part of the TFCA. You can see here to the upper right, we have included also the upper parts of the Quando River Basin, even though it's not part of the uh, CASA TFCA, simply because it's very important for the water management as we go forward. To the lower right, you can see the population density. It's very low in the upper part of the Quando Basin, indicating that we're dealing with a rather pristine system. It's not regulated by dams or anything, and uh, it's mostly a perennial system. Now, in terms of the international significance of the system, um, it's part of the upper, uh, of its upper part of Zambezi River Basin. It's shared between Angola, Namibia, Botswana, and Zambia. And uh, the headwaters is located in Angola. So what uh, happens in terms of development in uh, the upper parts of, uh, in the headwaters in Angola will be influencing the downstream quite significantly. And for that reason, it's very important that the countries are now coming together to uh, cooperate around their shared water resources. 
It's also partially an endorheic system, and you can see there are some similarities between the Okavango and the Kwando River Basin. They are sort of uh, parallel, and um, some features are similar, while there's also quite distinct differences. Now, in terms of uh, uh, drivers for change, population growth is a major one. You can see the, the, the growth rate here. And climate change is the other one where we have seen a significant uh, decrease in precipitation over the last 10 years. And we also see a significant correlation um, with the El Nino and La Nina indicating that we have some uh, ways to, to predict uh, if we're going to have a wet or a dry year. Groundwater plays a significant uh, role in the area in terms of drinking and domestic water. About 30% of the uh, local communities depend on groundwater. It's very important for livelihoods, livestock, and small and large scale productive uses. And then, of course, it's very important for ecosystem services, for wildlife, and, um, and the nature in, in, in general. Groundwater underpins the landscapes. Oftentimes we forget that and we focus on the surface water systems. But what we are trying to understand here is the conceptual setup of uh, the Kwando River Basin and uh, how groundwater is, is being generated and how it interacts with surface water. Um, some of the key features that um, relate to groundwater and aquifers in, in the Kwando system uh, is that we have a, a fairly flat topography. You can see in the upper right here, so large marshes and uh, uh, wide floodplains are characterizing the Kwando River uh, with large interactions between surface water and groundwater. Geologically, we're talking about a two-layer system with the Kalahari sands uh, sediments on top of uh, Karoo basalts and, and sandstones. But when you get downstream, um, you see um, this system is being significantly disturbed through uh, geological features, uh, falls and so on, that have um, disturbed the system quite a bit, which is making the analysis and um, uh, plans for development a lot more complicated. And so it's very important that we get a better understanding of these uh, systems. Finally, just to round off uh, the discussion around the international cooperation and with particular focus on, on groundwater. And so there's a need to better understand the groundwater dependent ecosystems and under that the environmental water requirements uh, and how groundwater plays into, the, into those. Uh, we've been looking at the transboundary diagnostic analysis for the, for, the, for the system. And as we get more information, we'll further develop that. We'll also be looking at vulnerability mapping of the area and, and where groundwater can come in to support uh, better human and uh, wildlife access uh, and water security, basically, and avoiding human wildlife conflicts. Finally, we'll be looking at um, a transboundary groundwater management framework as part of a strategic action plan, and finally, better understanding where we have transboundary aquifers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, um, thank you, Karen. There was that. That was very useful to understand the context. Hello, my name is. Uh, you, talk, uh, you talked about the Kwanda River, and now we're going to um, uh, Beauty Mbale from WWF, who's the freshwater team lead, is going to talk about the the Kwanda River, the kind of pressures it's facing, um, and what it's like in the area. So, uh, Maxwell, if you could please play. Uh, Beauty's video presentation. Thank you. Afternoon. My name is Beauty Mbale. I'm the freshwater team lead here at the uh, WWF uh, Zambia office, uh, and I will give you. Uh, I'll be presenting on the Kwando Basin. The Kwando Basin has uh, a length of about 731 kilometers. Uh, it's got a basin area of uh, slightly under 97,000 kilometers squared. It's characterized by higher rainfall in the upper parts uh, of between 1,000 and 1,200, and between 600 and 800 in the lower parts of the river. The, the river basin in its upper part is perennial, and then as it tapers down, it, it's uh, more or less ephemeral. 
and has uh, constant, relatively constant uh, flows between its highest and lowest flows uh, of uh, long-term average flows of uh, between 27 uh, cubic meters per second and 39 cubic meters per second in its uh, wettest year. Why is the Kwando River significant? Uh, first of all, it's a major headwater tributary of the Zambezi River. Secondly, it is a transboundary river basin and it's shared by four countries, Angola, Namibia, Botswana, and Zambia. It is also home to about 2.5 million people and also provides critical water resources to the heart of the Kaza FT, TF, uh, CA, uh, where it shelters half of Africa's uh, remaining savanna elephant population, and also critical for many other important wildlife species. And in spite of all this, the, the Kwanda River Basin has remained largely underdeveloped, uh, with several competing pressures over resources, uh, for instance, uh, between wildlife reserves and pastoral communities uh, with the changing socioeconomic circumstances of its local residents. So initially, when we, we started our work in the Kwando River Basin, we wanted to have a scientific knowledge of the status of the basin. And therefore, uh, we have been undertaking assessments and are almost uh, finalizing the, the state of the basin report whose key conclusions uh, are basically that the river is mostly unchanged and relatively pristine, uh, and that conservation is the dominant land use in the basin. Uh, there are also very low levels of environmental degradation, and then pressures from it actually mainly arise from uh, pollution from the towns that are around or near the, the river, but then also the, it's characterized by frequent fires, as can be seen in the lower part here. We have also uh, been working on establishing what the health, the general health of the river basin is. And this is basically a stakeholder driven assessment of different indicators, social, cultural and economic, as well as health that stakeholders in the basin choose and for which we've been collecting data. And we're almost uh, concluding with the grading uh, of the health of the river. Uh, with most of the data, as you can see, the green uh, parts here where we have collected all the data and with only just a few where we are remaining to collect uh, data. We have also been working with the communities through our partner, Akadir, and through them, we have uh, trained uh, a little over 360 community members in water management at community levels. Uh, we're then now going to build on this uh, by establishing fish reserves under the dream, under the, the, the program that we, we are now going to undertake, which is the Dutch Postcode Lottery um, uh, Project. Uh, where we are seeking to then now get environmental flows established, and this is building on the state of the basin report that we've done. Uh, we're also going to build on the bankable work that was done in, in, the, in the basin, uh, and also build on this community water stewardship through establishment of community fish reserves. Underpinning all this is also the strategic uh, planning uh, of the river basin where we're looking to look at where we're, we're looking to have a more strategic uh, plan developed for future development of the basin. All this is underpinned by transboundary dialogue and its importance, especially the fact that we have four member states that are involved and, and, and therefore even as we began our work in the area, we established what we call the Kwando Joint Action Group. And so far we have held three Joint Action Group meetings uh, and have through these have promoted the exchange of knowledge, dialogue and cooperation between uh, member states. We are working of course, not only with the partners, um, with the member states, uh, Zambia, Angola, Namibia and Botswana, but we're working with partners such as the United States Department of State, the USAID, the, our local partner, Akadir, and the research is one where we do, we're conducting with the University of Maryland, and quite recently with the Duke University, 
uh, and also working very closely with the Kazo Secretariat and most dependent on the ZAMCOM, which uh, is the body that uh, ensures this transboundary cooperation for all the Zambezi uh, riparian countries. So in essence, this is basically the work that we have been doing in, in the basin. Thank you. Thank you, Beauty. Uh, some great work being done. We're going to go straight on to look at the issue of human wildlife conflict, uh, which is obviously there's been a lot of conflict around water. You heard Corin talking about uh, times of drought and times of wet. In times of drought, we know there's a lot more um, conflict with uh, uh, animals. Um, Simon, if you could um, go straight into your presentation. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Steve. Um, Maxwell, I think you can just go straight in and start presenting um, the recording. Mm -hmm. Peace Parks Foundation, Here he goes. based in Sierra Mangwezi National Park as a technical advisor. We'll be discussing the role of reconciling water development with human wildlife conflict. So what is human wildlife conflict? These are the struggles that arise when the presence or behavior of wildlife poses threats to human interests often has a negative impact on people and or wildlife. Challenges people, human wildlife conflict challenges people and wildlife, causes a decrease in people's tolerance for conservation efforts and coexistence with wildlife in their respective landscapes. Human, human wildlife conflict is also has a significant threat to conservation and livelihoods and needs to be addressed by allocating adequate resources and developing partnerships. Only then we'll be able to look at long-term coexistence between people and wildlife. In the Kaza Transfrontier Conservation Area, um, we have one of the largest, well, we have the largest contiguous elephant population in the world, with a number of 220,000 elephants counted in 2019, and most of these are concentrated in Botswana and Zimbabwe. Of the total Kaza area, 22% is in, within protected areas. And with an increasing population, elephant population in certain areas, combined with human population growth and settlement in existing wildlife dispersal areas, leading to increases in human wildlife conflicts, resulting in increased illegal killings and the increased need for problem animal control. Within Kaza, Sierra Mangwezi is situated almost central in the area. And the situation there on the ground um, we have increasing migration of people into the area, linear settlement along the Zambezi River here. And as you'll see, elephants, um, elephant corridors are being settled. And um, during the dry season, we have elephants moving out of the park to the Zambezi for permanent water, for permanent water source. If we look at the elephant movements, we have very much a resident population during the wet season in the park. This starts changing with the onset of the dry season, and this year it even happened a bit earlier. In March already, the elephants were moving out of the park. And um, by May, Ju June and July, the elephants are almost resident on the river where people are living. This is what it looks like on the ground, or what it looks like from on the ground, we have situations like this where elephants are moving between villages. You see a small village here with people having a look at the elephants, cars stopped on the road. And um, this is what the situation looks like. The elephants trying to move back from the river now, back after drinking and often disturbed by human um, activities. So we've got a human wildlife conflict situation where people and wildlife are equally dependent on the Zambezi River. Look at these number of incidences over the last two years, or last year, and then this year. Um, we're already looking at 52 human wildlife incidences involving elephant. And this is due to the fact that they've moved out of the park so early in the year. Mitigation approaches. Um, there, are, there are several methods which are already in use, and we're looking at a best practice approach to using a lot of the methods that have been employed, you know, such as chili fences, chili bombs, electric fencing, elephant restraining line, crocodile fences. We need to also proactively sensitize effective communities on human wildlife conflict issues. In the medium to long term, 
get a community agreement on elephant corridors and enforce local restrictions and then use an incentive reward system for communities who maintain these corridors. In regards to reconciling water development, water management plan for the for the park and the game management area around the park needs to be to incorporate um, methods to maintain the corridors and then we're looking at developing boreholes along the river within the existing communities to decrease dependence on the river for water and this is especially with the crocodile um, uh, incidences where people are using the river and being killed by crocodiles thank you very much Thank you. Um, thank you, Simon. Um, so um, thank you for those presentations. I think it gives a very good idea, good background. I want to move now on to um, some of the government officials that are really involved in the day-to-day decision-making around managing some of these transboundary uh, water and conservation um, assets that are there in the region. And I do see them as assets. Uh, we have challenges, but I definitely see our conservation areas and our water resources as assets. There are not many places in the world I could say, like we just heard, that the water is relatively clean and pollution-free. So perhaps um, I could uh, uh, ask um, Pera Ramoli, who is the Executive Secretary for Oka, OCOCOM, which is the Okavango um, River Basin Commission. Um, Pera, there's many um, synergies, but also possibly some differences with the kind of work that ACASA is doing. But I think obviously you're dealing with the same footprint. How can we ensure that when we work with, for example, Okacom, and then we work with Casa, we're not wasting money? How can we make sure that there's better coordination between the efforts of these both very important organizations, even if they've got a slightly different focus? Thank you, Steve, and thank you, colleagues, for being here and the participants. As, as you may be aware, colleagues, we are managing a river system that is shared by three countries, Angola, Botswana, and Namibia, with its sources originating in the highlands in, in, in Angola and ending up in the Delta, which as you know, is an international convention of wetlands uh, of importance and therefore a Ramsar site. In 2014, it was further declared a 100 World Heritage Site. This means the complex system which we are managing requires very clear and concerted efforts between all role players in this particular case, ourselves as mandated to manage the water resources, both surface and groundwater in the basin to ensure that we sustain the ecosystem, part of which is also managed by the CASA Central as, as a TFCA. And therefore, it is very critical that we, in fact, cooperate, collaborate, instead of compete in our various activities. As I'm stating here, uh, the OCACOM, which was established in 1994 by the three countries, is responsible for and mandated to manage the water resources of the basin and for the benefit of the communities that subsist in this, in this basin. This is through making sure that we do equitable allocation, sustainable utilization, and sound environmental management of the basin, including sharing of benefits. This is based on a shared vision by the three states, which entails economically prosperous, socially just, and environmentally healthy development in the Kubango Basin. I think it's important for one to lay down this background so that when one talks to the issue of how we can collaborate with their respective partners, organizations, it is clear that we are managing a system that is transboundary. And therefore, what is important is for us, and we have done this with CASA, we've already established a memorandum of understanding that we adopted in 2019, which outlines the respective tasks, roles of each of the organizations this is in a way to make sure that we build synergies as opposed to creating overlaps that would obviously, as you indicated, lead to uh, either over uh, underutilization of resources or misappropriation of those resources when they are applied to similar things. Now, OCACOM strictly is responsible for the management of the water resources component 
including obviously other land resources that are required to ensure that the basin stays and continue to provide ecosystems benefits that the three countries would ultimately require. This MOU therefore becomes a good principle or a good instrument for us to cooperate. In addition to this, the structure of OCACOM is such that it's multi-sectoral in terms of the organs that have been established. This being the commission itself, which is established with uh, each member state being represented by three, at least a minimum of three commissioners, the three of which may be coming from various sectors that are having either interest or impact on the water, and therefore it's multi-sectoral in nature. We have the Basin Steering Committee, which is also having similar arrangement in terms of membership of minimum of three coming from each country. And we also have technical committees. Therefore, it is critical that when we are cooperating with other organizations such as CASA, our respective uh, bodies or organs do collaborate and do things that are best based in the specific area of competence and area of mandate. And therefore we ensure that this creates a synergistic as opposed to a, 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 a rather conflicting uh, of interest type of arrangement. So mm -hmm. we have succeeded to work with CASA in that, in that context when we are dealing with a number of issues, including fishery management that can be dealt with by the two organizations and other aspects of uh, managing the system to ensure that the benefits of the one over 1 million people that subsist in the basin are accruing to them and they then become uh, beneficiaries of a system which we are responsible for managing. So it is very important that we closely work together and closely with our partners, including, of course, working closely with our sister basin, which is the Zambezi River Basin Commission, which we have already been working together. We are working together closely on not only sharing the best practices that each of us are doing, but also noting that we are managing systems, at least in the upper parts of the basin, which are similar, as our headwaters originate in one country, whose activities would then determine how much or what quality we get downstream that transcends the three countries. At least Great, thank you. Thanks, yes. thanks, Barry. That's, um, that's useful. I think you talked about mandate, you talked about Zambezi. I, I know we've, we're running out of time because of some of our technical difficulties, but I want to give time to um, both um, Evans Kaseke uh, from, uh, from Zamcom, you mentioned Zamcom, and uh, one of the representatives from Angola. Uh, um, Evans, perhaps you could just comment, uh, you don't just have cars, I think you have other conservation areas, obviously, also that might inter interact with the Zambezi. How, for you, can we make sure there's collaboration between the TFCAs and the River Basin organizations? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, with the response to, in the response to what you have just uh, uh, addressed, I would like to say that, you know, um, the Zambezi has got, uh, you know, just like what has been alluded to you by my uh, colleague, Pera, um, the Zambezi has got um, the framework which is the strategic action, uh, the strategic uh, plan for the Zambezi water course, which enables it to actually collaborate with CASA as well as other partners like WWF in addressing issues of concern to not only to this organization, but the member states. Also be advised that, you know, we have got both, um, we're talking of CASA, um, Okakom and the Zambezi, we have got member states in common. So the issues that they are actually addressing are also the same. But to ensure that you know there is no conflict uh, when it comes to addressing those issues, these organisations um, have been formulating um, MOUs. And with those MOUs, it is possible now to actually focus on particular issues, which when addressed can actually enhance the provision of uh, uh, services, the, um, the, the livelihoods that are obtaining in those particular areas. 
And one of them that I could just see, um, a few that I could just touch on. With OCACOM, we have been actually cooperating on issues of data and information. How is that going to be managed? This is critical for decision making. And also when it comes to, uh, to CASA, WWF, these organizations, these as partners, have been in the forefront of generating data and information in highly specialized areas that are of benefit to the bigger framework, which is, you know, SAMCOM. And we also have a mandate from the Council of Ministers to cooperate and report every year on the activities that we are working on in conjunction with these organizations and the information data that comes out of these cooperative activities um, are important for decision making. And as of now, um, Zamcom is also cooperating with CASA on the issue of groundwater. Very little is known about groundwater. And it is important that you know we get to know the dynamics, the behavior, the availability of groundwater because it sustains the ecosystems, the human population, the wildlife in this particular landscape. And also there is um, going to be another um, initiative to ensure that, you know, uh, OCACOM, uh, OCACOM, ZAMCOM and CASA, WWF cooperates in research and development um, pertaining to groundwater issues. So I think um, these are just some of the items I could point on. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've literally have one minute left, so we might get cut off before we end this. But I'd like to invite uh, Man Manuel Quintino from the, the National the Department, National Institute of Water Resources in Angola, um, to comment on, I think, one of the big challenges is the water is coming from Angola. How can we ensure those communities that are part of producing the water get access to water? What is the biggest challenge you face in terms of giving communities access to water in Angola? Thank you. Are you hearing me? Yes, yes, we are. <clears throat> yes, in fact, part of the water is coming from Angola. And Angola, let's say, openly is sharing this very, very, very good resource with, resource with the all community within Sadek region. But let me state, uh, start with the following. We need to talk to cooperate regarding water issues. And the main issue for cooperation is the Sadek revised protocol on shared water resources, water courses. So there is a need for water diplomacy. That's why countries, Many countries have signed a, a, a couple or a number of water agreements. And I can mention SANS, and the CUVECOM, and the OCACOM, and the, and the ZAMCOM, and the CUNENE, the PJTC, the Permanent Technical Commission. I could go down to ORASINCOM and the INCOMAT Maputo. So without the cooperation, we cannot go further. That's why we consider water as, as, let's say, element of cooperation. Regarding, let's say, the, the well-being of people, of course, we need to develop our, our, our water resources, let's say, at basin-wide, nationwide, uh, following what our must, master plan says to us. At least in the case of Angolan portion of the Zambezi Basin, on the Angolan portion of Kavango Basin, on the Angolan portion of other basins like Ovelai and Kunene, our, let's say, internal strategy. And we, we take this, this internal strategies for a negotiation when we go to, let's say, to negotiate our transboundary perspective. So at the end of the day, our main, our main goal is, is, is to provide water, be, be it surface or even ground, to, 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 to people so that people could, could survive, could have, let's say, their, their, their life, let's say, uh, with, more, with more prosperity. Please. Thank you. Thank you. I think 
Um, I want to, to thank you for your, your comments. I think the key thing I took from it is diplomacy, which is talking. Instead of in Angola, as we know, has a long history of war. Those areas come out of a long uh, history of war. Now is the time for peaceful development. Water is key to that. So, and I think across the boundaries, uh, all of the countries in Southern Africa are showing leadership, I think, to the world in terms of how we share these resources and, and, and how we go forward. So I think with that, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, I know we're over time. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you for making the videos and taking the time out. And to those of you who signed on to our session, thank you very much for attending. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to talk about. Feel free to reach out to any of the organizations or people here, and I'm sure we can put you in contact with the correct people. Uh, go well and enjoy the rest of the Stockholm World Water Week for the rest of the week. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, facilitator. Obrigado. Thank Obrigado. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everyone.